Hello, everyone. You're listening to the Blockchain Socialist Podcast, and I have a really exciting guest. You guys may have heard about him because I recently published a a book review um, about the book um, that he recently published. His name is James Muldoon. He's a researcher at Autonomy in the UK, a senior lecturer at the University of Exeter, and the author of Platform Socialism, which is out with Pluto Press. So, hey, James, how are you doing? Yeah, good. Thanks for having me on the show. Of course, yeah. before I started reading the book, when I reached out to you on Twitter, I was like super excited. I knew I had to read this book because I felt like, I mean, the 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 concept of platform socialism itself sounded something that would really be interesting to me and the projects that I'm interested in. And reading the actual book itself, I was excited throughout the entire time. I was like, wow, wow, wow. Every time I was reading like um, the next uh, chapter and the next paragraph. But Maybe to start off, I think it'd be really interesting to know from your perspective, what made you want to write a book like Platform Socialism? What do you think that the left has been sort of missing when it comes to the digital platform field? Um, Well, thanks for the praise. Always good to hear that people enjoy reading the book and it's not just all marketing spin. Um, So the book is about how how we can create fairer alternatives to today's digital platform. So it's trying to answer the question, what would a more just, a more ethical social media network look like? What would a, a better search engine look like? And how would these kinds of systems be organized? Um, and I wrote the book because I wanted to offer a perspective of someone essentially outside the tech world looking in. So I wanted to start from the politics rather than the technology. Because I noticed that a lot of the the more critical perspectives on the tech sector that were starting to get, you know, mainstream attention, you know, following the tech lash and stuff, you know, tech insider turned critics like Tristan Harris and, and more recently Francis Haugen, you know, these people who who were kind of offering the dominant criticisms of, of the tech world uh, were, were people whose entire worldview, whose entire ideology uh, was shaped by the industry. And I think that really came across in the kinds of solutions that they were offering, in the way that they were framing the problem. Um, and in many cases, I think that the kind of criticism and, and, and the you know, solutions were basically just continuing the same logic um, of platform capitalism. Do you have any examples of um, what maybe like some of these whistleblowers like proposed? Yeah, um, so I think you could probably like uh, to get to to get more into this. I think you could probably um, divide the kinds of criticisms that were being offered into a, a, a couple of main different perspectives. I think the most popular one is what I would call a tech humanist critique, uh, and this is what you would have seen on that Netflix show, The Social Dilemma. I think this is kind of Tristan Harris's position. You know, um, the Jaron Lanier, the, the one of the co-founders of virtual reality. It's this idea that the problem is that there are these unethical uses of technology, right? Uh, that that technology is is su- subverting our our psychology. That we're being manipulated. That we're like nothing more than automatons or lab rats, uh, and that social media is kind of controlling us. So I think that's why this humanist element really comes to the fore. Um, I think what this misses, because really the the proposal is basically like a very individualized uh, account. It's basically like you should just stop using social media. You know, I think the the title of Jared Lanier's book is like 10 reasons why you should, you know, turn off your social media accounts. Um, And it's all about the businesses basically doing better, you know, that the, the CEO should be more ethical. It's all about it's framed as like a, an issue of consumer choice. And I think what this misses is is the kind of structural incentives that the companies have to develop products in a particular way. And and what gets left out of these discussions is the the broader political economy of the sector and the fact that, look, these products are being created because they're profit-driven companies, that they're incentivized to maximize growth and engagement um, above all other considerations because essentially that's them doing their job. Um, so it's not really an issue of, of kind of ethical CEOs, you know, needing to do better or, or Tristan Harris becoming the, the head of this new think tank. I don't think that's really going to solve the problem. Um, so that's like the tech humanist criticism. 
I think the other big dominant one, which is less about popular culture and more about the kind of governmental sphere, about how to regulate big tech, is this anti-monopoly agenda. You know, and the the real aim here is is about how to restore competition to the tech sector. You know, this slogan that um, Elizabeth Warren had about breaking up big tech. Um, so I think that's it's partly about like a kind of antitrust thing. So about preventing mergers and acquisitions, but it's also just about how do you regulate the tech sector, right? Um, because I think, and and so I think one of the problems with this kind of anti-monopoly agenda. Um, is that even if you were to break up these big conglomerates, right, even if you were to separate Facebook uh, from some of its smaller companies, um, the smaller companies would still be forced to operate by these structural incentives in a very similar manner um, due to the competition that that, that would exist between the firms. Um, and and so I think the anti-monopoly agenda tends to frame the, the, the problem around questions of competition, about creating fairer markets. But again, like, much like kind of um, Shoshana Zuboff's ideas uh, in the surveillance capitalism book, um, it, a, a lot of this, the solutions are framed around strengthening markets, um, you know, creating better consumer rights. Um, but this really risks further entrenching the marketization of these online spaces. And I think you know, you can, you know, some people do believe in a kind of more gentler, softer form of capitalism. But I think for those of us on the left, you really have to be trying to look more at non-market-based solutions about ways in which digital tools and these services can be organized um, as part of digital commons, as part of public goods that are kind of offered um, free at the point of use. And, and digital services that, that are kind of there to benefit everyone, not not to create a new kind of breed of winners and losers. Um, so I think they're the two kind of dominant approaches that I see. Now, the, the first one really reminded me of like, I guess, the way that um, a very liberal Democrat may approach politics as well, as if we just need to elect like the nicest person into office, or if we just have like a nicer CEO, nicer people at the top, then the, the problem will be fixed. That if, uh, I don't know, if, if, if all the CEOs just sort of, uh, and, and politicians just sort of like smoked a joint with one another and then like, you know, uh, became friends, then all of a sudden the problem would be fixed. But I think if you're looking at this from a, uh, let's say, more structural perspective, if you're looking at the incentive mechanisms that are sort of built into um, the economy itself, then it's sort of hard to say that just having a nicer person is going to fix the problem and sort of like you need to fix the incentive structure itself maybe yeah i think so i think the the real contribution of the book is trying to shift discussion more to questions of power um and and also to like questions of ownership right and control how who owns these these kinds of companies it's not necessarily a question of like trying to fix facebook i think every time facebook or now meta you know messes up Everyone's like, oh, how do we how do we fix it? How do we how do we make things better? And I think what we're not asking enough is like, well, what alternatives exist out there? What prototypes do we already have? What traditions and histories can we can we draw on? Um, and you know, we don't have to accept the fact that you know all of this uh, infrastructure, which is now so essential to our everyday lives is run by for-profit companies. You know, there are alternatives that exist. And I think Platform Socialism, the book, is about exploring these both alternative ownership models, um, but also thinking about the more participatory forms of governance that you could develop there. So that, yeah, that's what I was really trying to do with the book. Yeah. And so maybe uh, it would be really interesting to hear, because in the, in the beginning of the book, you had a really good um, account of the history of Facebook and Airbnb and how they were sort of selling these utopian dreams for, I mean, what now we look back as like Web 2. Um, could you explain a bit what, how, like, how did they get away with selling utopia to us? And like, because to me, if I think about, I don't know, uh, my life and I mean, anybody like the past um, 10 years or so, like these companies and platforms, they seem to have entered our lives so quickly and so like so fast and like forcefully like I, I remember one time you know everyone was taking taxis and then all of a sudden like boom uber was there uber was cheaper you download it on your phone and like no one was taking taxis anymore it was, almost, it was like it happened in the span of like 
I don't know, maybe like a month, I remember uh, in college, everyone was taking taxis and all of a sudden everyone was taking Ubers. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the motivations for me writing the book was just like reflecting upon how profoundly reliant I was on all of these platforms and that, you know, I, I, the more I learned about it and the more I saw how unethical, you know, a lot of these services were and the kind of business models that underpinned them, you know, it really got me thinking about like, yeah, maybe, how did these all work? What What's going on? And I didn't really realize at the time, but I think looking back, you know, at least those first few chapters that you're talking about, it is really a kind of history of Web 2, you know, and one of the things I think I end up narrating, you know, and, and maybe this is very Hegelian, right? Because it's like it's only at the end of the era, the owl of Minerva flies at dusk, and you can only really understand what happens at the end. But I was kind of writing this in 2019, 2020, and there is this, it seems like there's this real turning point now. And I think one of the stories I tell in the book is how from really about 2015, 2016 onwards, a lot of these platform companies started to pitch themselves as global community builders. And I, I use the examples of Facebook and Airbnb in particular, but it's kind of around the time of Trump and this kind of global shift in politics um, perhaps away from a kind of classical left versus right paradigm to, you know, what some people describe as a more open, closed society. Um, there are other ways of kind of dividing that. But the tech companies were all very keen to kind of sell them this feel-good story of their products as enabling this new forms of digital social life, These, you know, that they were going to facilitate these online communities, um, you know, connecting people, bringing people together, uh, and so I developed this idea in the book called community washing. And I think this is the kind of marketing strategy of framing a business through the language of community empowerment and, and, and fulfilling a social mission that you're kind of passing off what is often a very like extractive business model um, a, as this kind of like community banquet that, that everyone's going to come together. Um, but the reality on the, on, on, you know, the reality of all this is that, the infrastructure that these companies are running is, is basically feeding directly off the activities of these communities, often with very little concern about the actual reality of the communities that they're claiming to serve. Um, and I think here, you know, with the rise of, you know, some of the Web3 discourse around uh, criticisms of platform capitalism, I think this is definitely something that that I do share with them, that that. The, the business model of the platform companies is, is often incredibly extractive. And, and I think I kind of define platforms in the book as, you know, what you could call value capture mechanisms or value capture devices that they're kind of there to, to, to create the environments within which people participate and interact and just scrape a little bit off the top, right? They're the kind of, rather than, you know, rather than like setting up a lemonade stand and selling a product that they, they want to be like the troll under the bridge that basically charges people to, to, to use it. Um, and it, it's really about acting as that intermediary um, that, that gives the platform companies, you know, their huge profitability, right? Cause whether you're extracting like a subscription fee, a transaction fee, or you're just harvesting data to turn into advertising products, that whole business model of appropriating the activity of others is really what it's all about. Um, and I, so I think this kind of like PR campaigns they were all running is just like super cynical, right? Because you, what you often see is that it's like the business has been around for five or 10 years by the time they come up with these campaigns, which is purportedly trying to, you know, tell you what the company has been about all along. Um but what's really noticeable about, you know, in the case of, of Facebook and Airbnb is that like the images are designed after the tech clash is already ramping up, that, that, that they're, they're kind of responding to the critical scrutiny. Um, and it's only really when these companies are pushed and challenged and people start to try and regulate them and there's like worker resistance and user resistance that they start developing these strategies to kind of diffuse the situation you know, rebrand, paint themselves in a new light. Um, and, and you know, something like Airbnb, for example, has been one of the most litigious startups of Silicon Valley and are really devastating a lot of cities with, the uh, you know, who are experiencing like unaffordable housing and gentrification and, you know, swamps of tourists and stuff. So, 
yeah so i think i think this idea of like selling utopia is like um you know a really important point about what they're doing because and and so this is another you know what i see is like a big contribution of the book i think as the left we need to start talking about how we're going to invent the future what does a more desirable kind of digital future look like what what kind of a society do we want to live in um because all of these new ideas that we're hearing about uh and i'll just say you know metaverse and web3 as the kind of two master narratives that people are kind of setting up to be you know the leading lights of the 2020s i mean they they're developed by venture capitalists to to sell predominantly to sell new products right as like the ideas that they're going to hang a kind of new generation of products and services on and and these are the innovative visions of the future it's like people are like worshiping elon musk and and these like people they see as as tech visionaries i think what the left hasn't done very well is creating its own transformative visions of technology you know rather than just resisting right rather than just saying no or having this like really cynical skeptical take on social media I think we really need our own inspiring vision of of the future of how people's lives will be better. How can we harness new technology for for socially useful ends? Um and because people want to think that their lives are going to get better, right? They want they want to to technology to be a part of that. And I think the most successful transformative projects that the left has had, you know, in in the past 100 150 years, has been you know when people have come to power on the basis of a radical reimagining of of what society should look like and these kinds of big transformative visions of you know going right back now things like universal suffrage and women's liberation and healthcare and these are about creating new forms of common sense for how we can organize society and i think technology at least like with the iphone generation and the kind of you know 2000s versions of tech I just think we've lost that kind of utopian imagination because it's just been so fast everything has changed so quickly and and people are barely trying to 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 keep up with that. So I think we need to start talking about alternatives to this. I think that's really important. Yeah, a uh, 100%. I think um what I really liked about your book is that um you do Uh, or you you don't do what a lot of left wing books kind of do um which is to like provide a wonderfully written critique and then sort of like one small chapter at the end of like a possible solution or like peeks at how it could be different and while i think you know critique has its place and critique is good and um we need to critique uh, i think for a lot of people if you want them to to join on your side you say you like if you want a lot of people a mass amount of people to start joining your side i think you need to and provide an alternative like if you they may agree that like yeah i also agree the world sucks but like what's your solution and if you can't provide something that looks better than what it is now sometimes i think i think you lose a lot of people um and or some people maybe get might get mad at <laughs> at that suggestion but i think that is true generally when i talk to others who are not in the you know left wing bubble but um yeah i think what to, to what you're saying about uh web3 uh what i think is really um so I, like i have i have very very like mixed uh thoughts on it cuz i think the maybe the term web3 was at some point i don't know if it was really organic but i think the the original term comes from gavin wood who is like the founder of polka dot which is a different just um blockchain uh, and then it sort of uh was co-opted uh cuz what i what i witnessed was that a lot of a lot of people who were not vcs who were just sort of like people interested in technologies and like and blockchains were they started to use the term web3 and then like i don't know maybe a month later like vcs were using it like crazy um like f- at least fr- from my perspective i see it i saw it a little bit more organic maybe um but then now like it's very obvious that web uh, that vcs have sort of like taken that narrative and are sort of you know morphing it into into what they want in a, in a more like explicit sense than maybe they were before but i think what web3 has provided a bit is an image about the future some sort of utopian image about the future which is why it's so enticing for a lot of people and especially people who um maybe work in tech but are sort of dissatisfied with the current you know sort of like big tech landscape i think there is a reason why a lot of 
developers are moving away from their big tech jobs into working in Web3 because they think that it is some sort of utopian vision, even though there's a lot of, um, there are probably a lot of issues with how they're thinking about it and they're not coming at it from a very like political lens, which is why like in my review of your book, uh, I strongly suggest that for people who are interested in things like DAOs to read your book, not because it is about DAOs, but because it provides like a more concrete political lens to look at the current uh, landscape of tech so that people can understand what that is, what the like common um, tropes are, like what what do these companies usually do? Like what what is community washing? Because I think community is a word that is also popping up again in Web3. And there are like, yeah, a lot of dubious like claims about community. Um, so I think uh, your book is was really good at um, showing what those problems are and what um, some of those alternatives could be. So I think it would be interesting if you want to talk about maybe um, a couple of the solutions um, that you mentioned in the book and how they avoid as well sort of like this common critique of like techno solutionism. Yeah, um, it's funny you say that it, you're like you were glad that it wasn't this book that like tells you all the problems and kind of analyzes them, and then it has one chapter at the end where it likes the best because it is like the classic narrative structure of like a um, I don't know like a lefty verso book or something. Yeah. And to be honest, the first draft I wrote was exactly that, <laughs> um, and I actually I submitted it somewhere, and and I had a, a couple of reviewers um, take a look at it, and one of the responses was, well, actually, the thing we like most about your book is some of these solutions at the end, but you just sketch them. Um, and I think what makes it really stand out is the, you know, the, the, the kind of overview you give and can you do that in more detail? So I, um, the book is actually written in 2019, um, which is why I say it's kind of this like web 2.0 like overview thing. And I actually rewrote it during the, um, the first lockdown in, in 2020 and really basically turned this final chapter into like the the entire second half of the book. So now it's kind of like three or four chapters where a lot of principles and models are kind of sketched out. And I am really glad I did that because it is one of my favorite parts of the book now. Um, so yeah, let me, let me, you, you know, you, you said like, let's talk about one. So in the book, um, I discuss quite a few different proposals for for basically democratizing platforms. How how can you have a more democratic governance structure of them? How can these services be run in a better way? And for me, the idea was to escape this notion that in order for a platform to be left wing or to be like an alternative to big tech, that it had to be nationalized. Now, I propose this, you know, a range of ideas for for platform ownership and governance. And, and I think one of the innovations is basically looking at how that can take place at different levels and at different scales, depending on the function of the platform. So there are sketches from, from you know, things like local workers cooperatives, you know, through regional and municipal kind of um, ownership structures, right up to, to national and international ones. So let me discuss one idea. Um, this is a kind of meso level um, related to... Uh, a ride hail platform. So kind of like alternative to Uber, shall we say. I think here, what really seemed to be most suitable is that this could be run at a municipal level. So that's either like a, a kind of city, city um, council, city government. Um, and, and because I think here, the infrastructure that you need to run a ride hail platform is quite difficult for, for a local workers cooperative to operate. Um, so I think while you can have things like food delivery services, um, maybe courier services, local kind of domestic cleaning, stuff like that, um, uh, run by workers cooperatives, I think as soon as you start really requiring big investment in the, the digital infrastructure, it's often better to have someone with slightly deeper pockets to be able to do that. So I live in London, um, London has a very good and efficient public transport system. So I sketch a, a kind of municipally owned ride hail platform in the book called Ride London. Uh, and this would be an on-demand service that, that you could imagine being run out of um, Transport for London or TFL as it's known here. Um, and I think the advantage of having TFL uh, run a service like this is because it can be integrated 
into the existing public transport options. So it's not just replacing um, Uber or other ride hail plat- platforms like for like, it's actually opening up the question to a much broader idea of um, mobility within a city and, and what kinds of public transport options are available because often the reason people are looking for these private options is because public transport is, is you know, inadequate. And so what I really think we need is like a lot more investment in public transport options so that when you think of the on-demand needs people have for, for motor vehicles, um, you can see how these could be much better integrated within trains, trams, buses, you know, other transport options within a city. And once you have a public body running a service like this, I think you can do, you know, it has several really immediate advantages, right? So the first one is about how the software is designed. Immediately, you can get rid of the whole crappy gamification of the the, um, experience and put workers' needs at the center. So the, you know, the data that, that workers are relying on can be made transparent to them. The algorithms could be more accountable as to how they're, they're um, operating, how they're matching riders with, with workers. Um, and you know, drivers obviously should be able to receive a living wage for this, that they're not exploited, that they're not trying um, to do this peace wage work uh, that, that leaves them so vulnerable. So you know, things, and I think it's just this absolute myth that with flexibility must come precarity, right? Uh, I think there's, there's, you know, ways to organize it where that's, you know, completely not the case. Um, yeah, so another, another advantage is um, obviously you could, uh, you know, nudge people using the app towards more environmentally friendly options. Uh, obviously, like, you know, Uber in itself is kind of a curse, right? Like it's quite, it's quite um, convenient. Um but it's not something we should be encouraging uh, people to do. I think it should be an option. I think like there are many people for a whole variety of reasons that need, you know, motor vehicle um, access and and for, you know, uh, a, the ability to use that if necessary. But I think, you know, if you had an app that, that integrated this service with other ones, you could kind of show people what other options were out there and kind of show them that, look, it might take two minutes extra, but you could take a tram and a bus and you'd... you'd you know, get there basically the same time. Because I think um, the the ride hail kind of boom has had this terrible effect in increasing traffic and congestion and, and pollution. I think there are ways in which we can improve that. So I think uh, that kind of municipally run um, ride hail platform is a really good start to doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's really interesting. Uh, you, you're probably aware of like um, the driver's cooperative um, in, in New York City and like what, what, what they're doing. I mean, I think there's uh, a lot of really interesting ways to go about, um, like especially ride sharing. I mean, w- w- what I like is that uh, I think what you said earlier, like sometimes nationalization or nationalizing is sort of like thrown as like the, that's what we need to do, just like nationalize everything um, as sort of like a simplistic uh, answer to um, like how to facilitate all of our needs when in reality we can probably be a little bit more creative and a little bit more um, nuanced to fit the exact situation and like the the service that you're providing because I mean uh, does it really make sense to need to have like a nationalized Uber Um, I mean I'm I'm a bit skeptical like that that someone would want that and so I think the taking a more local approach and like putting more uh, emphasis on like municipalities and like local uh, governments is something that's really interesting and what I think what you the the model that you use that I remember in your book was sort of like um, this libertarian socialist model. I think it was like J D H Cole. Yeah, J D H Cole. That's the it. the idea of like federating at at different levels and sort of like overlapping federations and sort of like mm. a to me seems like a very like hierarchical type of structure of different um, like feedback between different levels and, and and such that that in a way should make sense. Happy New Year's, everyone. May 2022 bring more class consciousness and less internet drama on big tech platforms. If you're enjoying the episode so far, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, share with a friend, and join the crypto leftist communities on Discord or Reddit, which you can find links to in the show notes. 
If you're enjoying the interview or find the content I make important, you can pitch into my efforts starting at $3 a month on patreon.com slash the blockchain socialist to help me out and join the newest patrons like Curtis, Andrew, Jacqueline, Josh, Peter, and Ishan. Any amount really helps since making the stuff isn't free in terms of money or time. As a patron, you'll get a shout out on an episode like I just did and access to Patreon exclusive content like Q&A episodes where you can submit and vote on questions you'd like me to answer and I'll give my thoughts in roughly 20 minutes. In the next Patreon Q&A episode, I give my thoughts on the proof of stake versus proof of work debate from a socialist perspective. Of course, I'll still be making free content like this interview to help spread the message that blockchain does not need to be used to further entrench capitalist exploitation if we put our efforts into it. So if that message resonates with you, I hope you'll consider helping out. Consider as well that I also recently published a book review of platform socialism on my website. So if you go to the blockchainsocialist.com, you'll find it under the blog menu. It comes out January 20th through Pluto Press. So be sure to check it out. And I guess what I want to add as well, like, like what, what makes this sort of like not techno solutionist? Uh, well, I mean, the whole book, I think, is really driven by a kind of politics first approach. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I don't make a secret of the fact that, like, I'm not a coder. I'm not a software developer. Um, I'm like, you know, basically like a historian of political thought, essentially. All of my uh, previous books have been on the history of the workers movement, different organizational structures that have been used, how democracy has been practiced over the past hundred years. Um, and so I wanted to bring that experience and the, and the kind of research uh, to the tech world and trying to think about what kinds of democratic structures, what kinds of organizations um, could we bring to that? And so you did, uh, well, you mentioned GDH Coal, so I feel like I should, I should quickly. Yeah, let's, um, go with, let's go into it because I think yeah, it's an interesting mention. Jump into that because like that, so I, I think really what I'm, what I'm pushing, the, the cart that I'm wheeling along in this book is, is basically a kind of what you could call an associational socialism. So a kind of, you know, you call it libertarian socialism, uh, which, you know, is also quite accurate, kind of left-wing socialism, a decentralized socialism. Um, and, you know, one of the primary reference points that I draw on in the book is, is this tradition of guild, guild socialism. And it sounds very medieval, right? Because a guild is like a, you know, collection of workers in a kind of pre-capitalist society. And they're like, so I, I, it was kind of a joke, really. It's like a lot of things that I do start off as jokes because like one of the chapters is called Guild Socialism for the Digital Economy. And you can imagine this like medieval guild trying to right. figure out what to do. In the, <laughs> but I think like, there are these really prescient points um, of of relevance that I think are really fascinating. So this idea of federalism and and decentralized thinking is one of them. Um, but what what coal what GDH coal really um, allows us to do is to think about um, these more federalist and decentralized alternatives within socialism, right? Um, and now coal was like this British socialist writing in. Uh, I think the four of his most popular works are like written between 1917 and 1920. And he's like a, a critic of the Fabian society in the UK, right? And he's really critical of these more statist visions of socialism, ones that really focus on the nation state. The Fabian society was like a more... Yeah, so, so the Fabian society helped found the UK Labour Party. The right. Fabian society is a kind of like um, leftist organisation which overlapped you know, was around in the late 19th century and continues to exist today. They founded the um, the Labour Party. They founded the um, London School of Economics. Um, and they're kind of like one of the main um, dominant schools of reform, of, of progressivism in, in this time. Uh, and, and Cole was a member of the Fabian Society. And this, this kind of was, uh, and, and particularly in the early 20th century, really dominated UK progressive political thought. Um, and so Cole joined as a young man, but he quickly became a critic of the Fabians because he didn't think they had a proper appreciation of workplace democracy. So how local uh, decision making could be fostered, how people could have a genuine say in how their lives were, were organized. You know, he thought that, that the Fabian society vision was way too statist, way too bureaucratic um, and essentially would replace a bunch of like capitalist um, owners with, you know, distant bureaucrats, right? That it would just become this kind of status form of socialism. So um, 
you know, Cole developed what I think you can see is one of the most important visions of this kind of associational form of socialism. Um, I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but the the idea here is like there are all these major associations or, or organizations that that are like um, constitute your life. So you've got your workplace, you might have a school or a university, your clubs, cultural centers. And the idea here is that these organizations should themselves be internally democratic. You should be able to have a say in them. You should be able to maybe vote for representatives, but have some kind of input into the governance. And and the idea is to create a more participatory society through these intermediary institutions. So it's not all about the state. And really the guild socialist vision is about how the state could be reduced to something like a coordinating body, that that the most important decisions are being made at a much more local level, at these kinds of regional councils, um, and that you would see society as kind of constituted by these overlapping producer associations, you know, municipal associations, all of these different spheres of social life. And I think that's really the critique here is that the state kind of takes over and monopolizes all of these various authority structures that themselves should kind of have a lot more power. So there's this vision of people's participation in social life, of um, these associations taking on a, a bigger role. And really it's about extending democracy from this very narrow political sphere where you like vote for your MP and they kind of go off and represent you for five years and you never see them again to a much more comprehensive idea of kind of democracy being much more present in your everyday life through these more distributed forms of, of governance. Um, and so it's guild socialism, right? And I think this framework gives you a really new perspective on thinking about the digital economy. And I think it actually transposes quite well because you can start thinking about all these online communities and user groups that use platforms um, as various forms of uh, groups that should have a democratic say in how they operate, right? And here I think there's a lot of overlaps with some of the work that you've been doing um, and and other people. Uh, and I think what really I try to, to, to relate in the, the Platform Socialism book is that guild theory points you towards the functions that are being performed by each platform. So it's really thinking about what is the nature of the community? What's the purpose of the platform? What kinds of socially useful ends is it designed to serve? And how do you build structures of democratic governance that that reflect these? And I think that's why you can start to move away from this idea of one size fits all, you know, you have to have nationalization and, and start thinking about a more complex ecosystem of different forms of social ownership, right? So it's not just an individual venture capitalist unilaterally deciding where the investment gets made. It's much more about groups coming together and having a degree of control over the resources that that, that they're using uh, and, and a, a say in what kinds of governance structures um, the platforms are using. And so you can imagine like small social media ecosystems kind of being moderated by their users and and having kind of rules being developed. You can imagine small workers cooperatives um, deciding how their work gets organized um, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So that that was like beautifully said, (laughs) but like what, what is really interesting, like when you say all of that, like that, this, this was really at the moment where I was like, this is like a very good representation of like the idealist, you know, web three utopian, if I were to talk to, you know, the more um, thoughtful, the more like like non VC people in the Web three space, I think they would like they would almost say the exact same thing, or they would. I mean, maybe less in a less sophisticated way, maybe. But I think they would. When you say all of these things, I think it is what they imagine how they would want like the internet to be to be run, um, and like the the danger right now is just that these people being idealistic and maybe not having a a political understanding getting lost in sort of like the the venture capital hole like sort of like getting 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 convinced convinced by like anderson horowitz that like oh yeah we do have democratic control over this over this platform just because we have a token but in reality like you know the the vision should be much much grander than just like having a token and i think some people know that and other people don't 
But like what, what you explained right there, I think would resonate with a lot of the Web3 idealists, let's say. Yeah, I, I really think so as well. And I was very conflicted when I started reading more about Web3 because on these questions of like freedom and decentralization and community and democratic governance, the the more progressive ends of that world do seem very much like stuff that I've been studying for years now, right? The, yeah. the, the history of, of kind of... Um, you know, left-wing socialism, essentially, that that there would be these kinds of like more local forms of decision-making and democracy. Um, but the fear with some of the Web3 stuff is is essentially that it's a bit of a scam, that, that it's actually, you know, the reality of what's going on is very different to, to what's being sold to people. And that when people talk about... Um, you know, democratic governance, I think it is really important basically to to look at the power structures that are actually there and to, to look very closely at the political context rather than just the kind of glossy image because I think there's vast differences in, in what's currently going on within the Web3 space. And I, and I think that, as you said before, it has kind of been taken over um, and really is being driven by venture capital. And I think some of the things I've read does just sound incredibly confused, like ideas about, you know, this is a different kind of venture capital. VCs will have a different relationship to their communities. And I, I think that is very fuzzy thinking, right? I think that's when you're starting to really be <laughs> drinking the Kool-Aid a little too much. Um, but that's not to discount the fact that there might be more interesting ways of using some of these technological developments. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's um, definitely like a lot of the big stuff is sort of, uh, and a lot of the like the biggest hype men are definitely like conflicted and, and wrong. I do think that there are though some very, very interesting projects out there that don't have venture capital or who are, um, let's say, well, yeah, that, that, that don't get venture capital and are, are sort of antagonistic towards venture capital and are sort of, I think, in my opinion, are getting as close as we can to like a truly like community grassroots, like building of some type of platform. It's definitely the minority. I think it's just like the, it's the, the problem is just like the problem of capitalism is that like, oh, the people who have all the capital are at the top and the ones um, who don't are at the bottom who want to actually build stuff usually they don't have the money and so they have to um, sell their soul a little bit to venture capital sometimes or they just have to find new ways of, of raising money um, like I think the you know the the like the ICO stuff um, or like things that are similar to ICOs uh, initial coin offerings for example are um, like they're they, they come from a place of like maybe wanting to have a more like democratic way of raising money uh, but the problem is that, if you don't have a system of sort of like limiting the amount of money like one person can put in, which is like a difficult thing to do on a blockchain, um, then like it, it's ju it just becomes, it's just sort of like emulates the same power structures. But there are really interesting mechanisms with, for example, airdrops where you only, you give a token uh, for ownership of the platform solely based on how, how much people use it, um, I think is an interesting approach and like having different ways of just moderating identity and people being unable to like create a bunch of bot accounts and things like that. I think there is interesting work, but that sort of gets overshadowed for people who are not very, very deep into it. It gets overshadowed by like what's at the front and center because venture capital and the money sort of like pushes those stories up front and they have the resources to talk about their projects. Whereas all these more community led ones, they are all struggling to sort of like talk about what they're doing because they're all working on it. <laughs> Yeah. But definitely still the minority. Yeah, I, I can totally see where you're coming from. I think, like, for me, if there is one message to take away, it, it has to be, like, for the for the Web3 enthusiast to think m critically about the kinds of projects that you're getting involved in because sure. I, it just feels like an absolute minefield. But um, I I guess, like, it is kind of just sad what's happening with with kind of blockchain at the moment because it really so one of the things that came to mind is you know when you're talking about crypto leftism is it really reminds me a lot of my experiences with occupy so occupy wall street so i'm like an elder millennial i'm in my like 
late thirties now. So my, you know, one of my formative political experiences doing, you know, this stuff around Occupy and it, it, there was a similar vibe in that you had all these basically people that were relatively new to the left that were deeply involved and a lot of more establishment organizations. So like center left political parties, trade unions, people in the advocacy and campaigning world just really stood right back. And I think just the reputation that crypto has, you know, firstly, because of the environmental impact, right? Um, And secondly, because it's, you know, it is primarily or has primarily been used as this like speculative tool. Uh, It's very unstable, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think for a lot of people who are like already engrossed in the kind of campaigning and political stuff that's going on on the left, the whole space is just like this complete non-starter, right? There's no way you'll get them because of the optics, but also just like the the substance. There's no way you'll get them to go anywhere near there. Um, And so you just have these new people that are are kind of like sometimes discounted completely or just written off by some of the traditional organisations on the left. And I think the shame is that you therefore have, you know, zero cross-pollination between people who have all this really useful, you know, generational knowledge and experience and the history of like progressive movements and what workers have done, what feminists and, and you know, anti-racist campaigners have done and, you know, ha- different generations of like capitalist development and organizing. Um, and all that feels a, a little bit lacking sometimes in in this world. But also the, the leftists just have no idea what's going on in in the kind of blockchain space and and therefore um you know just completely dismiss it most of the time i think sometimes uh with a lot of the more community oriented uh groups that you were talking about uh it's it it basically seeds the entire ground to the venture capitalists who become the only voices in the space right and so they're talking about decentralization and everyone getting a token and being this radical redistribution of of wealth and obviously it's not going to be like that right because you don't become a venture capitalist to redistribute your wealth to to a bunch of like low-level software people um but there's no one else contesting that right or there's not enough people uh kind of coming from different areas and, and different traditions to to put their own spin on it or give a slightly different take um so yeah that that kind of yeah i i think that kind of sucks a lot yeah definitely i i I mean, I, I sort of feel at the moment that it's um, a lot of like, I guess, anti-crypto left critique is sort of um, a self-fulfilling prophecy a bit that, of course, all of these things that you say are that will eventually happen is going to happen if you just sort of like ignore it. If you just sort of like if, if you tell the left, don't go near it, it, it's going to turn into this, then it is going to turn into that because there is no contingency on the left to be they're involved in it to sort of uh, reshape it or to um, influence it. I think what's sort of uh, a huge opportunity at the moment that's being lost is for the ability of the left to influence um, the development of this technology, especially in the DAO space, the decentralized autonomous organizations. I think that is really like, if I were to tell um, people on the left who want to want to give influence, uh, I would say like the DAO space and people who are interested in DAOs is the most probably openly friendly towards uh, our type of politics from from what I've noticed. And I think they would be very, very um, easily influenced by it if we did. Because I think like what you said and during this whole podcast with um, and we, when you were talking about guild socialism and, and the ideas of that, I think that would really like that, that would be inspiring to a lot of people in the DAO space already. And I think that would begin to make them rethink or question some specific things that like maybe the left may have problems with or like to to help them when they are building technology or you know influencing others also in the DAO space and in the direction that it goes um so i think it's sort of without a contingency of course it's going to be a capitalist hell hellscape we live under capitalism like what more can you ask for what more can you expect if if you do nothing Hmm. i think one one of the big questions I have around DAOs is, you know, what kinds of new forms of democratic governance could be possible um, on the blockchain? Uh, And I think that's really interesting because I've seen a few, like the the biggest examples are not very 
interesting, at least things like um, Friends with Benefits, uh, what else is in the news, Constitution Dow, like none of those are really go- going anywhere with that kind of thing. I think Friends with Benefits literally still has the kind of one token, one vote, right? Mm, and actually, that, no. In token, no, in not Friends anymore. with Benefits, uh, as, far as, as far as I understand. Um, yeah, yeah. No. The like the way you get in is you have to purchase I think it's like seventy or seventy five of the tokens yeah. and then you yeah. get into the into the DAO. So like mm. and and when you buy the tokens you also have to apply. So you apply as like a person, and you give them your background. You say I'm working on this and that, and I like this and that about Web three. I'm excited. I want to get involved. And then they let you in. So there is like a they have like a whole actually very intense vetting process. Mm. Uh, to let you into the DAO. And so then it's only one person, one vote at that point um, because they, they vetted you. You just have to own at least 70, 75 tokens or whatever, which is at this point, because the price has gone up, it's like very expensive. I, yeah. I, was, offered, I was offered it at one point for like, I think $50 or something like that, or maybe or maybe or 200 or something like that, a, a much lower amount than what it is now. Yeah. Um, to go in, but I was like, nah, that's not my thing. And do you then, do you regret <laughs> that now? <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah, how do um, you don't have any friends with benefits? <laughs> yeah, so I but mean I th- like I th- Yeah, go for it. I would say it, it it would have been um I mean at the time I just didn't get it. It's it it seemed just like a country club mm. um that you that you like pay for. I mean there is what is slightly different is that of course you can sell the tokens when you want to leave. So like you mm. can get your money back. So it's like you don't really lose anything necessarily unless like the price is lower when the time you sell it. But yeah. So long um, as someone else wants to join, right? Right. And so like there is a bit of um I mean the it's yeah, they 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 created FOMO to like get into the into the cool social club because there's a, there are a lot of like people who are high up in in media and music and arts. Um, as far as I understand, so like a lot of a lot of artists want want to be in there, or a lot of people um, mm. who want to be a part of that world want to be in there, and that's why I think it's they've been able to to drive the price up. Um, so I mean, I, I'm not a hundred percent on. I, I think most of their governance, as far as I understand, is like not on chain. Yeah, it's actually mostly within their Discord group. It's just mm. that you have to buy the token and and apply to get in and and be approved to get in. But that um, like this is just an incredibly undemocratic system to have a really expensive, uh, exclusive sure. online community. Well, I think right? I think that's the problem is that they yeah. I think they didn't expect their price the price of their token to go up so much, <laughs> yeah. and so now they're they're in this position where they uh, they 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 want to be inclusive, but so many people want to get in. And I think my my could like. I can see why it looks bad because it looks like a country club, but I think at the same time, it still provides an interesting model in that, like, I think on the left, we also don't want it like fully open, fully permissionless, completely like non-invite type of groups, right? Like if, if we let everybody in, you have the chance that you are letting in bad actors. Like there, you can look at uh, decades of history to see, you know, uh, CIA operatives joining all these different left-wing groups or whatever. Um, you want to have some sort of vetting process. Like exclusivity is not necessarily a bad thing is what I would argue. I think it's really context dependent. I don't know. I mean, I think the CIA can afford the entry <laughs> fee, right? If they wanted to get into well, yeah, I mean, benefits, they could. For sure, I think for sure. so my, my biggest concern with Web3 and, and partly with DAOs as, as kind of part of that is that inserting these digital token systems into online communities is really just going to result in the further monetization and commodification of the whole web space, right? And so you talk about like not wanting to let bad actors in, but like charging for entry is not how you do that. That's not how you sort out questions of like exclusive communities. I, I, think- I mean, I, I agree, but I think that it's it like that's not the, like what the examples are now are not the end all of what is possible, I think. No, of course not. Of course not. But when when we're talking about friends with benefits, I just for think sure, for sure. that's probably going to be one of the main dominant kind of like I mean, the whole point of a DAO is that you you spend money to get in, right? That you buy the token, you're investing in the community. But, but this is this is where I think is an interesting like let's say mis- misunderstanding a bit is that mm. it it like you have to imagine at least how I imagine is that. Uh, like the smart contracts and and blockchains are sort of like a very open design space in which you can you know design your structure for how you how you want it to to reflect. Basically, what I'm saying is that that may be the dominant form at the moment because of 
lack of creativity, but it isn't like the only one. And you don't have to purchase a token to get in. You can still get a token via other means. Um, like, so things like airdrops, I think are a very interesting one where, you know, uh, you release, let's say, um, a, a proof of concept product and those who are interacting with, with your product get dropped a token, um, to be a part of it. So sort of like the idea of exit to community from, from Nathan Schneider, I think is, is, uh, a really interesting model for rethinking how you open um, like a platform up to the community. Like how do you give it to the community, to those who actually use it and not necessarily have to make it something that you purchase because being a, being an open design space, you can say, okay, this token is non-transferable. Even you can say that this token cannot be sold. You can program that into the token so that you decommodify it, I guess, or demonetize it if you want to in certain respects. Um, so I think like that, that sort of nuance is a bit missing in the, like in the, in the understanding of it. But I, I completely understand why people think like wh why you, why are you saying what you're saying? Because that is sort of like the dominant model. And that is sort of like the, the most, um, visible model. Mm. Yeah, I think that there's like, when you're talking about what are the, what are the kind of affordances of the technology, like theoretically, yes, it is possible to kind of demonetize a token insofar as it is, I don't know, freely given to a community um, uh, who who can then actively participate in governance on a kind of equal footing that there isn't uh, the these kinds of like more commodified aspects that it's kind of on this uh, like essentially like a stock exchange that the price is going up and down that it's like pay for entry into the community. But like that's that's obviously not what's happening, and it's not what's gonna happen, right? Like the so I, I think like I agree with you a hundred percent that that these alternatives are possible. But I also think when we're talking about Web three and what the kind of future of the internet is going to look like, there is this real risk that that when we're hyping up these kind of like alternative DAOs, that it's basically just going to give this cover for what will inevitably be like a co-option of the whole space. And if you have half the people in there running around talking about freedom and decentralization, when what's actually happening is really like in many respects, like a continuation of the commodification of the web in web two, right? Uh, that it, 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 there is a kind of huge problem there. And I think the, I guess that's uh, this idea that, you know, web three is like this kind of feel good concept that you have all these young people now who are like, thinking that they're part of some kind of anarchist collective that are like going <laughs> to blow up a pipeline or something that that's, I guess that's my problem. So I guess we're, we're, we're kind of, uh, we, we both agree that context matters, that the politics of it matters. And it's really just thinking about how power operates in these communities. And, you know, are, are they places in which people uh, have equal say, you know, is, is the structure of the DAO set up, in, in a way that gives people, is it more than just like one one vote, uh, sorry, one token, one vote, or is it like one person, one vote? How are those structures set up? Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, agreed. Yeah, I think, in you know, what is interesting is that you have a lot of this type of experimentation happening um, with different forms of, of, of voting and not, and I think there is what is interesting like a very skeptic, let's say at the top. So if you look at, I'm just thinking of like Vitalik Buterin, the, the founder mm -hmm. of Ethereum, yeah. is extremely skeptical of like token governance, of the fact that having your token sort of on the free market as something you can purchase, similar to like a stock in which it can be very, very easily manipulated in price, et cetera, et cetera, as like not being an optimal form of governance. So I think there are like, there are these different trends that are like, I guess to me, just interesting that they are sort of agreeing with the critique from the left, um, whether they know that or not, uh, about like the issues with with tokens and the issues of like mixing governance with the free market and how that's sort of like flawed. Mm. And then you have like more interesting things like uh, I don't know if you're aware of like quadratic voting and things like this that are that are interesting. They're not perfect and they're not like uh, a solution for everything, but I think it is it is a type of democratic structure that you cannot build reliably without a blockchain.
uh, quadratic voting is when you can transfer your vote on one issue to another one, right? No, it's more that it's more like the so let's say uh, let's say for example everyone gets a hundred points and they get like ten different choices that they yeah can yeah and vote you can on. distribute your your vote into different issues so you can like distribute all your votes to one issue right potentially but if you do that if you so if you put all of your votes on one issue it counts less than yeah, if you yeah, were to yeah. spread it out across so the, there's like a yeah, you know, you, you use a function to, to to measure the power, which I think it's 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 an interesting view um, of voting. But there, uh, you know, there's also conviction voting, which is another one where instead you're voting through time rather than through like um, immediate preferences, if that makes sense. Mm. But there's a lot of experimentation like that that I think would be interesting to the left as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I I remain Web three skeptical for the record, but I'm <laughs> sure, I'm sure. glad that people like you are out there doing the hard yards. <laughs> Uh, you know, figuring out what what might be possible with some of these uh, systems. But w- one of one of the other systems that I wanted to mention because I thought it was really interesting is that you talked about the Fediverse uh, a, a bit, yeah, um, and sort of how it resembled guild socialism. And you know, I'm 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 on Mastodon, so like I I've used the Fediverse quite a bit. And what I found sort of frustrating is that I don't see very many people on the left that are on Mastodon. Mm. Like, I, like a lot of the big Twitter profiles uh, of, of of left wing celebrities, none of them are on Mastodon, as far as I know. I don't see them no, on Mastodon. Yeah, as yeah. Like a... I'm on Mastodon. I'm not very active there because, <laughs> as as you rightly point out, no, no one else is on there. Um, but yeah, I think that is a problem, right? That we don't see many people. Uh, like I don't know. Sometimes I feel like the the you know, and or like tech critical leftists is like the main the main thing that you're doing is just self promoting on all the tech platforms exactly, and that's kind yeah. of like tech criticism in practice. So I think yeah. it is it's like yeah, as I said before, it's like oh, what are the alternatives? And even if they are a little bit buggy and very small scale, I think it's really important to look at what is out there. Um, and so. I, I gave you earlier an example of what I think like a uh, municipal ride hail platform would look like. Um, in the case of social media, I don't think that a, a nationalized kind of state run social media service would be ideal because it's missing all of those decentralized affordances that, that kind of seem native to the whole idea of having like a, a social network, right? And obviously you, you don't want like a state network that it only allows people from one country that's kind of goes without saying but i also don't think a government or even an administrative an administrative body at arm's length from the government is is the right kind of organization to run something like that so what i find striking is when you look at the kind of federal organizational structures of people that are involved in guild socialism, for example, but also other federal examples on the left, right? So a lot of the anarchist tradition really moves in these kind of federal spaces. Uh, Hannah Arendt, who's someone that I kind of did my PhD on, uh, also kind of has this federal model of what she thinks a kind of ideal political organization would look like. That starts to resemble in really interesting ways the kinds of prototypes that are coming out in the Fediverse. This idea, and I think that one of the key principles here is thinking about how you can maintain a kind of broader network while still giving a degree of autonomy and independence to the, uh, the nodes within that network. I think that kind of is a way of balancing freedom with authority in many ways, that, that people could have some say in how their node works, but still have access to and still communicate with and coordinate with uh, these these other kinds of um, actors within the network. So, uh, you know, the example that I give in the book is that I think, look, as socialists, we should be thinking more about these federal alternatives to social media. I think something like the Fediverse, and I know there are other examples of like um, software that's been developed, but obviously Mastodon is, you know, one of the most like user friendly at the moment. It's one of the ones that you don't need that much or, or any really experience with the kind of technical side of things to kind of get involved with. Yeah. The only problem is none of my friends are on it, so <laughs> it's hard. I, I didn't, I didn't know you're on it. I'll, I'll find you, um, and we can, we can, you know, toot to each other. But I think this idea of like a decentralized alternative within the social media space is is really important. I think 
yeah, more people on the left should think more about the Fediverse and and do do kind of find me there if if you if you join. <laughs> Definitely, I think. Um, and what's also cool is what I did to make it a bit easier as I go back and forth between the two. Because I mean, for me, the idea I think for a lot of people as well to have another social yeah. media account for another platform is like overwhelming. It's already Twitter itself is already overwhelming enough. So like. Um, you can, um, there's some bots. I need to, I need to look up the name now. I'm forgetting. Oh, that like auto post stuff. Yeah. That, that auto post, any tweet that you do also oh, goes onto good. Mastodon and you can oh, also, you can also do it the other way around on Mastodon. Okay. Tweets you need, you need to show me that after this, after this podcast. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, it, and that's, so I think having these, um, these type of tools to like help you transition is also really like, mm. I, I, like, I think that is that like these type of things should be in the toolbox for left-wing organizing, <laughs> you know, like mm. as, 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 as like maybe silly and maybe sounds in the beginning, but like really, um, you know, to try your best to try to, um, transition into more, um, decentralized tech alternatives is like a worth, a worthy, like left-wing thing to do, I think. Yeah, definitely. So for the creation of platform socialism as a, let's say, a political project to come forth, you mentioned, so, so we talked about both of these things, right? We talked about um, the creation of alternatives and regulations um, being put in place from, from the state and not necessarily saying that, we're, you know, this, this is not like making clear it's not like a statist project in the way that like the Fabian society was maybe. Yeah. How do we, like, how do we think about which one comes first and maybe how do we overcome things like regulatory capture? In terms of the question of strategy, I have this framework within the book of resisting, regulating, and recoding, right? So that's like the three R's. I think I get this from, um, uh, I got the framework from Mark Graham, who's this uh, professor at Oxford in their like internet institute. I don't, I don't even know if he uses those exact R's, but I remember him using the three R's of some description. But the way I see it is um, it gives you this really nice model of like bottom up, top down and building alternatives. And and I think rather than seeing these as like things that will come uh, one after the other, I think they need to be kind of pursued at the same time because, and that they, they kind of help, they, they build off each other, right? Because on the one hand, you have like resistance, you have bottom up resistance from workers who are kind of on the front lines in the platform economy, who are kind of in the logistics supply chains, um, you know, delivering meals, working on the, the back end software, cleaning the data, um, working in these companies that they can actually join unions, they can build their power, they can kind of name and shame companies, um, from the ground up, right? And you can have this as a kind of, um, and also like users, right? Users of platforms can also engage in building collective power and and, and building these forms of resistance. Um, but at the same time, I think it, it can't all, I think things like boycotts and like user, you know, collective actions sometimes can lack teeth because the platforms are basically too big to care, right? That even if like big advertising companies pull out, it, it's like a drop in the ocean for them. So I do think that you can't limit it to just these kinds of bottom-up tactics, that actually regulation matters. Um, and for whatever criticisms, you know, I or others might have of a kind of anti-monopoly or like a liberal agenda, um, obviously things like protecting workers' rights, limiting the power of companies to kind of become these big uh, conglomerates, all of this is super important, right? So most recently we've seen the EU directive on platform work, which came out in December, that is about trying to prevent abuse from these companies as acting as digital gatekeepers. Um, there was a really interesting um, aspect of that where they wanted to have a presumption of employment status for, for uh, workers in the, the platform economy, which I think is really important. And I was writing about that at the time. Um, but these two things, resisting and regulating, are also mutually ex uh, are also interconnected and independent. Because when you do get these big pushes from civil society, it, it basically emboldens regulators and politicians to take a stronger stance, right? Because they think it's going to be popular, they think it's going to help their chances of getting reelected, and it's going to go down well. Um, but also the regulations often help protect workers and they, they help support them in their struggle against the platforms and they give them uh, the basis for building more democratic power. 
Um, and so finally, the third R in that is recoding. And maybe it's this aspect of it, which I think is is slightly more innovative, because I think this idea of building prototypes and alternatives to the platforms is something we don't talk about enough, and it's something that we don't do enough. Um, and so I'm interested in platforms that are kind of run on either as public goods or as a like a commons-based model of social production. Um, and I think the most important, it's potentially the most important aspect of the strategy, right? Because y- you're basically going in circles if you're just talking about putting a few more regulations on them, you know, resisting them. It's still basically not contesting the fact that these, you know, digital infrastructure companies are basically like the 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 way in which our lives run these days and that that's basically a for-profit service, right? If you believe in public services and in offering goods free of charge to people who need them, um, then you need to talk about what kinds of alternatives we could develop. Um, so I think it's kind of, it's a question, if we're talking about political strategy, um, it's always going to come back to questions of power. What are the points of vulnerability of the big tech platform companies? Um, and, and I think this is really interesting. Something I try and point to in the book is that because they act as these intermediaries and gatekeepers, even though they look like some of the most powerful people in the world who've achieved the position of such dominance, kind of unseen uh, by any corporation ever, um, there is a weakness there because it's it's they're very reliant on us, like all capitalists are. They're reliant on our labor, on our lives, our cars, our houses, our activity, um, and it's really through us that they make money, right? Because they essentially are skimming a little bit off the top. They're acting as intermediaries, but they can be replaced, right? If you develop the software to be able to, you know, run your own um, food delivery service, to be able to um, have community-led and community-run services. Um, It's us that actually do all the work, right? So it's, and I think one of the questions is therefore like a coordination problem. How do you make the switch? Because the companies make it so damn hard to have interoperability, to be able to be on on Mastodon and basically slowly, you know, coerce all your friends to come on with you because it's so hard to communicate between platforms. And, you know, these platforms can be very sticky. Uh, once you're on something, it's very hard. It's hard to stop using, you know, Amazon will send you the product the next day or two <laughs> days later. It's hard to go yeah. back to the, <laughs> the local bookstore and be like, hello, boys, you know, here I am again. Um uh, and so I think forcing them to be interoperable could be a really interesting regulatory strategy. I think, um, who mentions this? The uh, the sci-fi writer, Corey... Um, Dr. O. Dr. O, yeah. So he has this great essay on interoperability and kind of gives you the example of, I think, telephone lines um, and, and the way in which, you know, the early internet providers basically built on the back of the telephone companies kind of against their wishes. I think that kind of that kind of framework is is very interesting and, and important. I think uh, what's interesting about that that framework and approach is that it is uh, multi-pronged mm, for me that it's exactly. not that it's not like cause sometimes um, with some people that I, you know, get into online debates with, um, unfortunately when I get sucked in, like it's sort of like it's almost it feels like they think that I'm having a an argument that, you know, no, we should do X versus no, we should do Y as a way to bring socialism. Mm. When in reality, I think like the world is just way too complicated for us to do one thing to fix the problem and that we have to think about a lot of different types of approaches at the same time. And it's sort of um, sad to see for me, at least whenever someone is trying to do maybe the I don't know, the recoding part, but mm. they're really obsessed with the, the regulating part, then uh, like you're, you're sort of, you're um, hurting your friend a bit or like you're, you're, you know, you're sort of preventing one of the other R's by sort of over emphasizing the R that you are really into by like, for some reason, wanting to prevent the other R's. Yeah. And, and I think you also like, if, if it's not too immodest, I think one of the reasons I wrote the book is because I did want to try and show how a few of these different tendencies could be brought together, right? Like people have 
essentially there was like there was no positive project there was various forms of anti blah but it was very hard to get people to to kind of come together on something and it's also important to to kind of think that we all have different roles in the struggle as well like it's right. okay for some people to be like these software nerdy you know online community types that are doing the the kind of like experimental stuff while others are like off you know trying to work their way up the greasy pole in you know various governmental spheres trying to to fight for for better regulation of these things and then people doing all kinds of different things um and yeah and sometimes as you say they they can actually be you know helpful to each other and it's it's important to to acknowledge that and and to kind of see that uh yeah they can often yeah work hand in hand yeah well, um, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, I, I figured the last thing I would want to, to ask, I would love for you to share maybe a bit more about um, what you're doing at Autonomy. So I think it's a, it's a really interesting um, group that you're working for around the future of work and planned economy and maybe where people can keep up with you and your work. Sure. So yeah, I work at this fantastic think tank called Autonomy. It's a research organization that focuses on how work is changing uh, and is providing these analyses to support a post-work future. Um, so the think tank has produced some really interesting studies on things like a shorter working week, a basic income. Um, more recently, what have we done? Artists, artists as workers, um, some stuff around care work and night work. Um, stuff around the right to disconnect. And I work in a, a unit of the think tank called Autonomy Digital uh, about tech stuff um, with uh, collaborator Phil Jones, who is, you, you might know him, he's the author of um, Work Without the Worker, Labor in the Age of Platform Capitalism. And we have done a couple of studies together on platform cooperatives and the digital economy. And at the moment, we're working on a, the first study of micro workers in the UK at the moment. So hopefully that'll be out soon, just looking at some of the survey data. And you can check out Autonomy at autonomy.work. That's the website address. Uh, yeah, it's really great. I love working there. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, I guess, James Muldoon. You can kind of find me on Mastodon. It would be good to have more lefty friends on Mastodon. I'm easy to find on both. Um, and I have a personal website, jamesmuldoon.org. I don't, I'm not an organization, but jamesmuldoon.com was already taken and I didn't want to pay any money for, <laughs> so nice. yeah. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. It's been really great, really good chat. Really love talking about Web3 and, you know, the possibility of socialist DAOs. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, thank you so much for, for coming on and for writing your book. It was a really interesting read and a really helpful read for me. Uh, for thinking about like where what what should we do with this technology now that it's already out there and how do we mold it in a more socialist lens? Um, I think you know it was it was really interesting to hear your thoughts on Web three right now, and I think it's sort of up to up to the people who are making the technology to make working with the technology to make a point on whether or not socialists should come on board or not. It's sort of our job to speak with people who are skeptics and to um, build the types of things that these maybe uh, well these skeptics who are maybe on the same side politically to prove that they should join us in sort of reshaping the technology and to think about the technology more. So I know that's, that's, that is on me and your book was a really, really great read. It's out uh, with Pluto Press. And so I highly recommend anybody who is interested in DAOs to pick up platform socialism because it is really good and it will provide a good political understanding about the technology um, that you may want to build with your uh, hopefully socialist DAO. Fantastic. Well, I'll be watching this space closely and I hope we get the chance to, to work together more in the future. For sure.